Well, good morning, church. My name's Dusty White. I'll be leading us through the liturgy. This is Jared. He'll be leading us. This is Olivia. She'll be leading us. This is Micah. He'll be leading us. Welcome. If you're on the live stream, let's rise and worship our triune God. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hear the word of the Lord from Luke 24, verse 5. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for raising Jesus from the dead, conquering sin, death, and hell forever. Would you give us joy this morning as we remember Jesus' resurrection and we celebrate his victory through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
and repent of our sins together. So let's acknowledge our lack using this confession of sin. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have left undone the things which we ought to have done, and we have done the things which we ought not to have done. Have mercy, O God, Forgive our sin and grant that we may live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear now God's words of pardon and peace to his people from 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. Yeah. Amen. So to all who hope in Jesus Christ this morning, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. Rest in it and be at peace. Sin. 
in a really long time, maybe ever. And uh, you should know that we're a church that's striving not to be necessarily hip or trendy. In fact, we're striving to actually be old and historic and well-rooted. And one of the things that roots us as a church is the Apostles' Creed. And it seems fitting, especially on Easter, to, to recite the Apostles' Creed because the Apostles' Creed unites us not just to one another in the room, but to Christians anywhere and everywhere throughout the world today. And so let's profess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Virgin Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Why don't you turn and greet somebody without shaking hands, just maybe make some eye contact through your mask, <laughs> greet somebody in the name of Christ. Well, it's so good to be with you uh, on this Easter Sunday. Again, my name is Dusty White. I'm the pastor of care and counseling here at Cormdale Church. All your pastels are looking fantastic. I mean, like from up here, you look like just a giant bouquet of flowers. I'm not sure what the spiritual implications are there. I think it's just a spring thing, um, but you look great. Um, we're a church committed to connecting people to God and to each other in a disconnected culture. And every week is somebody's first week here. So if that's you, here's a few ways that you can get connected to our church. First of all, you can sign up for our weekly email. It goes out every single Monday. You can sign up at the front page, on the front page of our website at cdomaha.com. Secondly, you could text connect me to this number. It's going to go to that guy. And that is Ryan Meyer. He's our director of connections. And some, he, either he or somebody from the connections team will follow up with you in a timely manner. Uh, and then third, you could stop by the connection desk in the atrium. If you're in the fellowship hall, it's upstairs on, on, by the main doors on your way out. And at that connection desk, you're going to see people wearing green name tags. Anybody with a green name tag, by the way, today is a leader or volunteer at the church, and they can help answer your questions. Right by that connection desk or underneath it, I should say, or there's going to be some books. That's a bookshelf. And uh, that is where you could go to find some resources about the scriptures, about theology, or about Christianity in general. And uh, here at Cormdale Church, we don't take up an offering during our worship services. Instead, you'll see an offering box on the way out of the main doors of the building. And we trust that if you're a Christian, you're honoring the Lord by giving generously. Now, one of the great things that God our Father invites his sons and daughters into is prayer. So would you join me as I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we're first of all grateful to just be in the room. Uh, we realized that last year we weren't able to do this, and so we realize that you've extended us special grace and mercy to be together this particular Easter in this building, and we are grateful. We're also really grateful for the people who were baptized right here last night, and we pray that this weekend would continue to be very special for them. May they bask in your resurrection power for them personally. We also pray that your resurrection power and your hope would be near to those that find themselves lonely. Uh, they might be here physically, but due to relational turmoil or due to just the reality of loneliness, would you grant them resurrection power and hope to trust you, to cling to you? We pray for those who have experienced job loss or employment 
things have drastically changed for them over the last year. Would you grant them resurrection power and hope today to cling to you who never changes? And Father, we pray for those battling addiction or slavery to sin. Would you break these bonds by the power that we see and hope in the resurrection? Would you pull them forward with gospel light at the end of the tunnel? And Father, today, may, may we not just show up here and dress up here. We need Jesus, and we need the resurrection power that he grants to his people. And so would you break the bonds of sin? Would you set captives free? And would you turn on the light of salvation for those that you're drawing to yourself even this morning? God, we come here needy. We ask that you would refresh us, that you would enliven us, and that you would awaken us to your glory, to your freedom, and to your grace. We are here to encounter and worship the risen Christ and to see you gain more ground today and this week than yesterday. And now we pray as a church, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And they were speaking to the people. The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Well, hey, friends, it's good to be with you this morning. It's Easter, so the sermon is about the resurrection of Jesus. I hate to spoil it for you if you didn't know that that's what we're going to talk about. That's the deal this morning. Um, I realize in this particular service, the 930, there are some of you joining us on the live stream. And so uh, if we're meeting you in your living room, thank you for joining us. And to those of you who are here in person, really great to be here with you. My name is Bob. I'm one of the pastors here within the Cormdale Church community, uh, Cormdale family. It's great to be with you. This is our first Easter in this building. It got canceled last year. So good to have an actual Easter here with you. Yeah, that's cool. And by the way, I realize this is also a Sunday when lots of guests are among us. And so, man, if you're here and perhaps you're not even a Christian, you're here among a church and sort of exploring what Jesus is all about. And if that is you, I know it takes courage to come into a room like this where a bunch of people are singing songs to Jesus. And this feels very religious and very intense. And so really honored to have you here among us as we explore the Word of God together. Um, Here's what I want to remind you of as we get started this morning. The resurrection of Jesus is a historical event. Uh, We're talking about something that took place in time and space and history. 
And Christians have always been very upfront about the fact that if the resurrection didn't actually happen, if there wasn't a person named Jesus who got out of a grave in Jerusalem in or around 33 AD, if that didn't happen, then what we're doing here is meaningless. Uh, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a verse that Dusty referenced earlier, uh, the scriptures say to us, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. So Christianity is not a practice in like spiritualizing the resurrection, and isn't it great that sort of we can just pretend like Jesus rose from the dead? Christianity is based on the truth that the resurrection of Jesus really took place in time and space and history. And the best evidence for the resurrection, or some of the best evidence for the resurrection, is the existence of a community of people who were so convinced that this took place that it changed their entire lives. It changed everything about them. People don't tend to give themselves and to give their lives for an illusion. You and I both know people can believe all kinds of crazy stuff, but at the end of the day, if they have to die for something crazy, they're going to reassess what they think, right? And what we have in the early church, in the record of, of this movement called Christianity, is a bunch of people who were so convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, they literally gave their lives proclaiming that that actually happened. And we're going to look this morning at the testimony of some of those early followers of Jesus, some of those first people to believe and testify that the resurrection really did happen and that it had implications for the world. So, if you have a Bible, I want you to open it to Acts chapter 4, the passage that we just heard read. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, there's one under a seat near you. And in that particular Bible that you'll find, uh, Acts chapter 4 is on page 857. We're about to put the words up on the screen. And so you're like, why would I open the Bible? You're just going to put it up on the screen for me and I'm going to see it there. Uh, but we like the actual Bible. So feel free to open it if you have one. Acts chapter 4. Verses 1 through 4, let's get ourselves into the story. And as they, this is Peter and John, two of Jesus' most famous disciples, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, <laughs> greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So notice what they're proclaiming, the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. We're coming in here just a few months after the resurrection of Jesus. This is in Jerusalem, the very same city where Jesus died. And these early disciples are proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Presumably, if the Jesus didn't rise from the dead and they're in the city where he was crucified, all we have to do is go over to his tomb and say, guys, he's right here. Let's just put all this to rest. This is a conspiracy theory, right? But in this city where Jesus himself was publicly crucified, these apostles are proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. And it says, so many people are persuaded by this that there's 5,000 men, it doesn't even give us the number of women and children, who join and believe that Jesus really was raised from the dead and come into this new movement called the church. The reason it only gives us the number of men here is significant, and here's why. Because in Judaism, as the Jewish faith spread throughout the world, to form a synagogue in a new city, you had to have 10 Jewish men. So the writer of the book of Acts is telling you there is 500 times as many people as that forming this new thing kind of like a synagogue called the church in Jerusalem. This thing's massive. It is a massive movement. And what's happened to sort of create this amazing response is not only are they proclaiming the resurrection from the dead, but earlier in the day, a lame man had been healed. That's what we read about in Acts chapter 3. There's a man who's been crippled from birth and who everybody is used to seeing at the gate of the temple because he's there asking for charity. He's begging for alms. This is something in the first century that was very common. And it's a way that God provided for the needs of the needy. And so this guy 
had been there for years begging at the gate of the temple. This is like if you drive around the city and you come to that one intersection where there's always that one person kind of panhandling and you sort of like build a rapport because you look at them one time and but then the next day you're there again and then the next day you're there again and it's always like you sort of develop this friendly like, oh, there's the panhandler again and th- th- it sort of creates this familiarity. That's what's happening. Everybody knows who this guy is. He's not unknown. He's not some random person in the city. He's, he's the guy that for years has been begging at the gate of the temple, and Peter and John come upon this guy, and they say, hey, actually, in the name of Jesus, why don't you get up and walk? So this guy is healed, and now he's walking around Jerusalem saying, hey, guess what? Jesus has healed me. And so this is obviously unsettling and surprising, and people are talking about it, and the word is out in Jerusalem that something is afoot. And so this little Jesus movement is upsetting the balance of power in Jerusalem, and so the religious power brokers call in the apostles, and they ask in verse 7, by what power or by what name did you do this? Notice they don't say, hey, we all know that guy wasn't really crippled. This is like a publicity stunt you guys put together. They don't say, hey, we think psychologically maybe he thought his legs didn't work and there was just sort of like a, a new way of seeing and he sort of was psychologically healed. They say, hey, how in the world, by what power, by what name, Did you heal that guy? Like, how did this come about? And here's the answer the apostles give. Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, Oh, so that's why, what you want to know is how did we do this good deed? By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In their answer here in Acts chapter 4, we learn three simple truths about the resurrection of Jesus. And I just want to survey them briefly this morning, and then we'll all go have brunch, all right? Three simple truths about the resurrection of Jesus. Number one, the resurrection changes what is possible. The resurrection changes what's possible. Our greatest conceit as human beings living in the modern world is that we think we know what's possible. Like we are actually very arrogant about what we think we know about how the world works and the possibilities that do and don't exist in the world. If we don't personally know it, there's an expert somewhere who knows everything there is to know about something. And so generally speaking, as a human community, we're convinced that we know what is possible. And yet every once in a while, something happens to remind us how little we know about what's actually possible. Perhaps you saw the news that came last week out of the Large Hadron Collider, the most famous physics experiment in the world. The Large Hadron Collider is a physics lab in Switzerland. It's the world's largest particle accelerator. If you're not into science, here's what it consists of. It's a 27-kilometer ring of superconducting magnets chilled to a temperature of minus 271 degrees centigrade, colder than outer space. This configuration allows two particles to be accelerated toward one another at a very high rate of speed and to collide in a way that produces the possibility to explore new avenues of physical science. One uh, researcher described it this way, it's like firing two needles 10 kilometers apart with such precision that they meet halfway. So basically, I'm going to stand here. You're going to go down to Little Italy. We're both going to shoot a needle, and they're going to meet each other exactly halfway between us. Right? That's some pretty fine-tuned science. Well, last week, physicists at the Large Hadron Collider announced that they might have discovered a new force of nature. According to the original press release, they unveiled new results which, if confirmed, 
would suggest a violation of the standard model of particle physics. In other words, what these scientists are telling you is, we don't know everything that's possible. That's the whole reason that we do these experiments is because we're learning new things every day about how the universe works. In fact, it's possible, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but it's possible that we've discovered a new force of nature. That there's things happening in the physical world we haven't even figured out yet. We don't know everything that's possible. And see, the resurrection changes what is possible. Look at verse 10 of Acts 4 again. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. In the normal course of events, Lame people don't just get up and start walking. But the resurrection changes what's possible. It brings something new into the world. By the way, keep in mind, sometimes we look at events like this in the Bible and we think, oh, well, this is some, some sort of like random miracle. It's not. It's a sign to testify to the reality of the message that, be, that is being preached. And keep in mind, not every lame person in Jerusalem was healed. There were certainly other people who were disabled besides this one man. This guy was healed, and he was healed to make a particular point to the people who looked on and to say something about what the resurrection of Jesus Christ has made possible. What's happening in the resurrection is the inbreaking of a whole new realm of possibility. What's happening in the healing of this lame man is God is declaring, hey, things are possible in the world you've never thought about. By the way, this is true not just in the realm of spirituality, but actually the resurrection of Jesus has made things possible in the world that previously were not possible even for people who don't believe in the resurrection. So, one of the most fascinating writers I've read in recent years is Tom Holland, who's an expert on the early Roman Empire. And here's one of the points he makes in his book, Dominion, which just came out a couple of years ago. He says, hey, things we take for granted in the Western world, things like the existence of human rights, things like the fundamental equality of every human being, things like the importance of freedom, these things are the heritage of Christianity. You can't explain the existence of these things in the world apart from the Christian faith. Because if you go back to Rome, they certainly didn't believe in the equality of every human being. They certainly didn't believe there was such a thing as human rights. They certainly didn't believe in the concept of freedom that we embrace. So even if you reject entirely the resurrection of Jesus and you totally are a skeptical, secular Western person, the way you understand the world to be is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus and the movement that came out of that. The resurrection changes what's possible in your life and in the world. So listen, the resurrection changes what's possible for you this morning. The healing of your body is possible. Recovery from your addiction is possible. The restoration of broken relationships in your life is possible. Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, things are possible in the world that previously were not. The resurrection of Jesus, friends, changes what's possible. Here's the second thing I want you to see. The resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of something new. The resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of something new. Look at verse 11 of Acts 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and which has become the cornerstone. Now, so we have stone, builders, cornerstone. This is construction language, right? And any of you who have been around construction know it all starts with the foundation. Or any of you that have had a wet basement know it all starts with the foundation, right? If the foundation is not good and sound and stable, bad things are going to happen in the construction project. This text is saying this Jesus has become the cornerstone, the foundation stone. The cornerstone of what? What is the building? What is the structure 
that the text has in mind. Well, hold your finger in Acts 4 and flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember, 1 Peter chapter 2 is written by Peter, the very person who's preaching here in Acts 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, says this. As you come to him, Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, Jesus is the cornerstone of what? Well, this text in 1 Peter tells us that you, as you come to Jesus, become a living stone in this spiritual house that God is building that starts with Jesus as the cornerstone. And notice in 1 Peter 2, there's language of sacrifice. There's language of priesthood. This is temple language. It's drawing on the imagery of the temple and the tabernacle of God in the Old Testament. Listen, every religion on earth has sacred spaces. Every religion on earth has spaces, places where they believe that heaven meets earth, that the divine and the human come together, that God meets human beings. In the Old Testament, that place was the temple. It was holy and set apart because it was a place where God met with human beings. What this text is telling you is that in light of the resurrection of Jesus, the sacred space in Christianity is not a place, but a people. God is building a people, and the foundation of that people is the resurrected Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the foundation of something new. It's the beginning of this great building project, God building a people. Notice the language of construction in 1 Peter is mingled with the language of like an organism, right? You're a living stone. So stone is a construction image, but a living stone, something that has life. It's implying that you and I as human beings are being built into the spiritual house that God is building. God is building a people, and the risen Jesus Christ is the foundation and the cornerstone of that people. Listen, I want you to be a part of that people. God is inviting you to be a part of that people. It says, as you come to him, to Christ, then you get built into that people. In other words, listen to me. Church is not something you go to. Church is a people you belong to. And that changes everything. The church is not a building that you go to. It's a people you belong to by belonging to Jesus. As you come to him, as you come to Jesus, as you build your life on the foundation of his life, death, and resurrection, you are built into this spiritual house. So I want to invite you to come to Jesus this morning to build your life on this foundation. The resurrection is a foundation of something new. God is up to something in the world. God is building something. God is putting together a massive project called his people. And it all starts with the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is the foundation of something new. Here's the third point I want you to see about the resurrection. The resurrection implicates you. You have to do something with the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection implicates you. Look at verse 12. Oops, I'm in 1 Peter. All right, Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right, so you see salvation and the word saved. So now we're going to talk about getting saved, and I know where this is going so I can tune out, right? Wrong. Stay with me, people. All right? Set aside everything you think you know about salvation, about what that word means. Let's admit that we come in here with certain presuppositions about what that means. Let's set aside what we think we know and allow this text and these apostles to tell us what they mean. 
Notice, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, here's what the apostles are saying. They're saying the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not private truth. It's not like something that's cool for you if you believe that. Great. But that's not for me. What they're saying is the resurrection of Jesus is public truth. It's on the record. Because Jesus rose from the dead, there are implications for every person. The resurrection is something that really happened, and that means you have to do something with it. Jesus got out of the grave, and that means something for your life. Now, the healing of this man in Acts chapter 4 is an acted out parable. Like what's happening here is by raising this lame man to walk again, God and through his, through his apostles is showing us, is revealing to us, hey, here's a picture of what salvation looks like. This man is restored to wholeness and to fullness and to health. And that's a picture and a metaphor for what salvation is about. Salvation is God restoring the world and restoring you to what you were meant to be before sin and brokenness messed everything up. Salvation is a restoration to the original good that you were intended to live in and that this world was intended to operate in. That's what salvation is. And here's Here's what the Bible says about the reality of salvation, right? Our culture tends to think, you know what the problem is? It's all out there. The problem is out there. The problem is the wrong party is in power or the wrong policies are getting enacted or the, I was raised in a bad family system, right? It's all, the problems are out there and if we could just fix all of that, then life would go as it should. The Bible is exactly opposite from that. The Bible says, yes, all that is true. And do you know why all that is true? Because it starts with a problem in each of us. Like the, the, the key thing that causes the world to be broken is that every human being has gone their own way and turned from God. And so when these apostles say there's salvation in no one else, here's what they're saying. There's only one human being in the history of the world who's ever come back from the dead, and it's Jesus So of course, who else would you expect to find salvation in? Who else can show us the way back to what God meant for the world other than the Lord Jesus Christ who got out of the grave? Who possibly could bring us back to wholeness, could heal us in all the ways that we're broken, could forgive our sin in all the ways we need to be forgiven? Who else but someone who came back from the dead? Because after all, isn't death what all the brokenness in the world is sort of pointing us to? Like all the things in you that are out of sync and all the things in the world that are out of sync, they're all directing us toward the the big thing that looms ahead for every single one of us, which is death. And the Bible says death exists because sin exists, because we have rebelled against God. And so how do we defeat death? By defeating sin. And Jesus Christ defeated both, and that's why he rose from the dead, and that's why he's our hope. That's why he can only offer us salvation. So look at the last four words of verse 12. We must be saved. We need this. We are in dire straits. We must be saved. You, friend, need salvation. You need to be restored to wholeness. You need healing. You need the broken places in your life to be bound up and put back together. And you also need forgiveness. You need to be forgiven for the ways that you have contributed to the brokenness of the world through your selfishness, through your sin, through your self-interest and (laughs) self-love. Only Jesus can bring salvation, can heal us, can restore us, can forgive us, can bring us back into right relationship with God and with one another. And notice what this phrase, what this verse says. There is salvation in, catch this, no one else. There is salvation in no one else. Listen to me. Salvation is not about a belief system. It's not about a set of data. It's not about a religion. It's about a person. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ. Christ. You're not invited to come to a religion. You're invited to come to a person. 
The apostles are not telling you, change the, the way you think cerebrally about the world. They're saying, in light of the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, come to him. Belong to him. Become one of his people. Only he can save us, can heal us, can set us free. So notice, by the way, the glorious exclusivity and the glorious inclusivity of this proclamation. Like what they just said is, there is salvation in no one else. And sometimes when we hear the, the, the proclamation that only in Jesus is salvation found, what we hear that as is, well, I guess I need to believe the right set of facts. That's kind of what they're saying, but not really. What they're saying is there's only one person who's ever gotten out of a grave. And because of that, there's only one person who can heal you, who can restore you, who can forgive you, and who can reconcile you to God. There's nothing else on offer other than this guy got out of the grave, and that changes everything. So there's a glorious exclusivity. Only Jesus has come back from death. But there's also a glorious inclusivity here. They're literally saying anyone who comes to Jesus can get in on this. Anyone who's willing to come and build their life on this foundation, receive this grace, trust this person, anyone who comes to him can get in on this. So it's exclusive, but in a very inclusive way. There are no boundaries. There's no one excluded. There's no one who can't get in on this. Jesus offers salvation and healing and wholeness to everyone who will come to him. So friend, Here's the invitation. This Easter Sunday and every Easter Sunday, but especially here today, right now, in light of this message in Acts chapter 4, come to him. Lay down your life and take up his life. Set aside your name and take up his name. Do you notice the emphasis on the name in this passage? There's no other name by which we must be saved. In his name, this man has been healed. The whole point here is, you know what the fundamental sin for every one of us is? It's just living for our own name. Putting ourselves at the center of the universe and assuming that it's about us, life is about us, it needs to work for us, it needs to fit around us, the people around us need to make life work for us and things need to be easy for us and ultimately it's about my name and my glory and my kingdom and my needs and my wants and my desires. It's about me. The apostles are saying, no, 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 Jesus Christ got out of the grave and that means it's all about him. And so the invitation is lay down your name and take up his name. Stop being identified by your identity and be united with him. And friends, that's what baptism symbolizes. Last night, we baptized a bunch of people right up here at the front of the room in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What that is, is a lived out picture of what happens when we come to Jesus. The old you dies, your name goes away, and you are raised and given a new name, united with Jesus in his name, by his power through his resurrection, we are saved and healed and changed and restored. Friends, this Easter Sunday, won't you come to him and take up his name? Let's close in prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the glory of your resurrection. We thank you for the courage of your early apostles we thank you for this inspired word from you, reminding us that you alone can save us and restore us and heal us because no one else has come back from the dead. No one else has conquered death. So Lord Jesus Christ, for those within the sound of my voice this morning who have not trusted in you, who have not come to you and built their lives upon the foundation, the cornerstone of the name of Jesus Christ, would you beckon them and draw them to yourself this morning? And for all who've been united with you, who have taken up your name, who have testified in baptism that they have trusted in you and are hoping in you, would you renew and restore our hope and our courage and our confidence and our faith this morning? Remind us that the resurrection makes entirely different things possible in the world. And so in the places in our lives and in our stories where we need to experience new life, new grace, new peace, new things, new possibilities. Meet us in those places and remind us of your goodness and grace this morning. 
We pray for our good and your glory. Amen. Well, friends, Jesus Christ now invites us to his table. So every week when we gather together for worship, we come to the sacrament of communion, coming to the Lord's table. We just saw from Acts 4 that the resurrection changes what is possible. And that's true here at the Lord's table. This is bread and wine, and it remains really bread and really wine. And yet in this table, Christ makes himself available to you, invites you to come and feast on him and celebrate friendship and communion with him. We just saw in Acts 4 that the resurrection is the foundation of something new. And that's what this meal represents, it, that we are a new people united with the Lord Jesus Christ, existing and living in a different new reality brought about by the resurrection. And we just saw in Acts 4 that the resurrection implicates you, that there are, there are implications for our lives. We have to do something with this Jesus. And by coming to the Lord's table, we are identifying with him, taking up his life, trusting ourselves to him. The scriptures remind us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body, which is given for you. And likewise, he took a cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so we come now to receive his grace and to renew our covenant with him. This table is for those who are baptized followers of Jesus, those who have taken on his name in personal faith and in public baptism. And so if that doesn't describe you at this moment, then please refrain from this part of the service. You're welcome to stay in your seat. You're welcome to come forward and just pass by the elements. For those of you who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and who are part of his church, who have embraced him in faith and in baptism, be assured this morning, that your sins and your vices and your weaknesses and your failures should not keep you from this table. Christ welcomes all of his people to come and find strength and healing in him. So as we continue this Easter Sunday singing songs about the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to invite you to come forward to the Lord's table. If you're in this main room, we're going to ask you to step out the left side of where you're seated and come forward to one of these four tables at the front of the room. There'll be a server there who will place bread into your hands and then you can take a cup of wine or juice and make your way back to your seat and partake there. If you're in the balcony or in the atrium, you can come to wherever is most convenient for you. At the back of the room, there'll be an additional set of servers who have gluten-free bread and so if you need that, please go there. And if you're downstairs, you'll notice a similar flow. So the main table downstairs has bread and wine and there's an alternate table that's gluten-free if you need that. We're going to invite you to sort of move from the front to the back of the room and just follow those in front of you. Come now to the Lord's table as we continue to worship him. May you be strengthened as you do by the grace of God in Christ. Come to his table as you're ready.
friends, let's go out of here remembering that the resurrection changes what's possible for us. And if that means that it changes what's possible for us, that means that it changes for you individually what's possible for you. So let's go out remembering that this week. Listen, we expect and we hope and anticipate that some of you might need prayer this morning, or maybe some of you just want to chat a little bit more about the gospel of Jesus. Maybe you're provoked by that whole message on the resurrection of Christ. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to chat with you. Um, And would you now receive the benediction for the morning? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and remain with us now and throughout our time on earth until the day of his return. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week. Happy Easter, guys.